Okay, let's get started. Uh, we have a lot to do today and uh, not a whole lot of time to do it. Welcome to the third of our uh, classes at the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos on biblical scholarship and, liter and literacy. Um, the topic of today's class is going to be Genesis uh, 2 through 3. Um, and let's get started. So, last time uh, we discussed... Um, I give you some resources of specifically Genesis translations and commentaries. We talked about the names of God in the Hebrew Bible. And then we talked about the creation accounts of Genesis, the P and J accounts. Uh, mostly we focused on the peace account in Genesis 1, the J account in Genesis chapter 2, we mostly talked about in terms of contrast. Uh, we're going to have a whole class on what's called the documentary hypothesis, which is where all these letters come from. All you need to know for now is that the Bible is usually divided by scholars into different sources where things came from. One is labeled P, it's a priestly source. The other is labeled J because of his use of the name Jehovah, anachronistic use of the name Jehovah. Uh, I put some extra material on the class webpage. Uh, I will link that in the, I linked that in the email I sent. Uh, it will also be linked in the video description if you watch this online. And um, I put some extra material in the class webpage. So, for example, uh, I've got links to the lecture, links to the slides. Um, I got the book of uh, Genesis. Those are those three commentaries I mentioned and some articles you can look up and I'll try to link them instead of just have the description as soon as I can find a copy of the article. So hopefully that'll be a useful resource. There's stuff for today's class as well, including several links to articles that, that have more information about the topic we're going to discuss today. So like I say, I hope that that will be a useful tool for people. So today, today I want to talk about the origin of the chapter and verse numbers. We're going to have one thing of general interest and then we'll dive into a specific text. In this case, Jay's creation and Jay's account of the fall. And so the general topic will be the origin of the verse numbers. So, uh, well, I want to talk about that and the signing of the Magna Carta. And I know uh, those sound like they're not terribly connected. I promise they are. Uh, this is what the original biblical manuscripts look like. This is a copy. Obviously, this isn't the original. This is uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls account, uh, book of uh, Isaiah. But this is the sort of thing you would have had originally. And if you look at it, there are no chapters. There are no verses. There are, is something that sort of looks like a paragraph although it divides larger chunks than we would consider a paragraph in English. Uh, and sometimes there's even no spaces uh, at the word boundaries. It makes it hard to tell where one word starts and the other stops. So imagine, if you will, that someone said, in the book of Isaiah, it is written and then quoted. Well, you have no idea where. You don't know how to find it unless you have the entire book memorized. And in that case, you're even lucky because it's unlikely they would have said, in the book of Isaiah, they would have just quoted it without telling you where it was from. The only time they tell you from the book of Isaiah is when they want to make a point. Isaiah said this. But most of the time, when biblical authors quote other biblical authors, they just quote it and expect you to know it because everyone has the Bible memorized, obviously. Uh, and, and that creates all sorts of problems. In fact, one of my, uh, my beliefs is that one of the primary purposes of footnotes in a good Bible translation or in, in, in edition is to point out all the cross-references. When one person quotes another person, that ought to be in the cross-reference so that you know where is being quoted. But to do that, you have to have some way of marking a point. You have to be able to hold up a sign and say, you know, John 3, 5 or something and, and know what, what you're looking at and know how to find what you're looking at. So uh, that, that's what's missing in the originals. Uh, this guy is named Stephen Langdon. And... Does anyone here, do, who here knows who Stephen Langdon is before I even start? Nobody? I'm surprised. So, uh, I'm thinking that uh, the, there's a town named Lang for some reason, but we pronounce it as Langdon because of the... Uh, so there's a couple people named Langdon. Stephen Langton is, um, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, in the Roman, this was back before they became Protestants, so he was a Roman Catholic Archbishop uh, in, in about 1207 until his death in 1228. And if you're familiar with this document, that is the Magna Carta. 
he was instrumental in writing and encouraging King John to sign the Magna Carta. So uh, for those of us interested in the history of democracy and rights and freedom, uh, he's an important figure. He also, you now anyone could get King James to sign the Magna Carta. It takes a very special person to create the chapter and verse numbers in the Bible, and Stephen Langdon is the origin of those numbers. Uh, several people had done this before him, but he's the one whose uh, version stuck. So whenever someone opens the Bible and says James 3.5, they are essentially quoting Stephen Langdon, who also was involved in the Magna Carta. So that's, a, I think, an interesting uh, connection. We will notice, though, what that means is that the divisions are not in the original. And we will see examples today where, uh, I hate to say it this way, but where Stephen Langdon divides things maybe in the wrong place. We'll see different accounts, for example, starting in the middle of a verse, not just in the middle of a chapter. And so that's because, that happens because, Stephen Langdon was the one who did this, and he did a good job, but he didn't know as much as we know now, and he made some mistakes. So let's talk about the creation, the fall, and the atonement from James, or from, from Jay, excuse me, and from uh, Romans 5. Does this include the chapter so, divides themselves? Yes. The, the places where the chapters divides, he created. The places where the verses are divided, he created. So, some resources for today's subject. The first is a book by Jerry Cohn, Why Evolution is True. And whenever I have this discussion about evolution with people, especially religious people, if they don't believe in evolution, I usually tell them, I will buy this book for you if you promise to read it. So this is the book I give away. You know, Mormons will go wander around and give you copies of the Book of Mormon. I give people copies of Stephen Cohn's Why Evolution is True. Stephen Cohn is an atheist, but... Uh, he leaves that at the door when he has this discussion. He just talks about the evidence for evolution, and he proposes that you can believe in evolution whether you're a religious person or not, which I think is an important approach if you're trying to convince somebody. If you pit evolution against their theology, you'll find that usually they'll pull back and, and believe in their theology. Um, but if you tell them that it's possible to believe in what they want to believe and believe in evolution, you can help. And I. I'm a big proponent of this because I believe that evolution is the cure, one of the cures. I mentioned several. Uh, last class, last le uh, sermon I gave, we talked about a cure for uh, fundamentalism is history. Another cure for fundamentalism is evolution. Not because it's impossible to believe in religion and evolution, but because it really is impossible to believe in fundamentalism and evolution, which are not the same thing. So I think it's very important to, to kind of point out. The other is the Bible for normal people. Uh, they always start off their episodes with the only God-ordained podcast on the internet, which is a joke. Uh, and they also say things like episode 22, the five things Jesus wants you to know about the Adam story, which is why I'm recommending this episode. Um, they, they say these things with their tongue firmly in their cheek because these people are, uh, I would call them mainline Protestants, uh, but they are not fundamentalism fundamentalists, and they spend a good chunk of their time trying to convince people not to be fundamentalists. And in this case, he, he takes that approach with Adam and does a very good job. So if you want a believer's approach to not being a fundamentalist when it comes to Adam, this is a great podcast to listen to. He also wrote a book on the subject. Peter Enns is the same person who does the Bible for Normal People's podcast. So those are my recommended resources for today. So that leads us to Genesis chapter 2 and 3, the creation, the fall, according to Jay. Now, this story is incredibly important. It impacts everything. Um, for example, today, uh, it impacts what people think about the origin of evil, the role of man in nature. Uh, the inherent uh, nature of man is sinful versus good. Uh, we're sinful all the time. You know, that sort of thing comes from this story. It, uh, it influences the doctrine of original sin, which is taught in the, um, several Orthodox faiths. Um, it, it influences our perception of human sexuality the role of women in the world, whether men should rule over women, for example, the goals of God. Does God want us to be like him? Or is God trying to keep us from being like him and is mad at us when we try? Uh, the value of knowledge. Is knowledge a good thing or a bad thing? The importance of obedience. Science versus religion. If you want to know why so many Christians and, and people in America today do not believe in evolution, it's this story and it's the implications of this story. We'll talk about why it's so important to them. Uh, Adam as Israel, we'll see a symbolic account where the Jews will interpret Adam as a symbol of Israel itself, um, and we'll see how it, the story impacts the temple theology of Israel, and how it impacts Christian theology about the atonement of Christ. So it influences all sorts of things. It's very important. So let's talk about 
the poetic structure of P's creation. Remember, this is just to, to remind us what we've done. P starts says that the origin of evil is pre-existent. You remember before the creation, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, there was a watery, a dark abyss, evil. And then God began to create order out of chaos by dividing things, organizing things, naming things, blessing things. This is P's worldview because he is a priest priestly source. That's why we call it the priestly source. He's very interested in these things. And he divides them into a poetic structure where the first day light and dark is created. So on the fourth day, the sun and the moon that move through the light and dark are created. In day two, the water and sky is created. So the fish and the birds are created on day five. They move through the water and the sky. In day five, the earth and vegetation is created. So in day six, animals and man are created who move upon the earth and eat the vegetation. You see, he's organized this whole thing in a poetic structure. He's not trying to tell you the literal order in which things were created. He's ordering them and dividing them. And that's how P sees goodness. Goodness is created when you organize and order things. Jay's creation account has a very different order. Earth is created, then man, then the garden, then animals, then woman. And he uses different words to describe creation. In P, God just says, and it happens. For Jay, now Jay... Let me tell you something about Jay. Uh, if, if there is a reason the Bible has been memorable to people, uh, these, especially Genesis and Exodus, those stories are so memorable. If there's a reason, it's probably Jay. Jay belongs with the great authors of mankind, Shakespeare, etc. He tells stories about people. We watch the people. He gives us their motivations in two or three words, and we understand, we relate to them. They do things that we understand. They make mistakes. Even his heroes are very human. They make mistakes. They, they fall down a lot. And he describes God in, in hauntingly anthropomorphic terms. God, God shows up in the garden. This is not what something P would do. And he walks around. And he even loses track of Adam. And he says, Adam, where are you? And it's like he doesn't know. The God of Jay is very human. And Jay is very interested in humans. Um, and so you notice God creates things like a potter. He forms Adam out of dust and melds him like a potter. He plants a garden. He doesn't just say, let there be a garden, and there's a garden. He goes down and he plants the garden. And he picks Adam up and carries him to the garden, and places Adam in the garden. You see these use of terms that are very anthropomorphic. And of course, he uses the term Jehovah, Yahweh, to describe God uh, in a, um, what is a, um, an anachronism, uh, because the term Jehovah, Lord in all caps here in our translation, uh, was not known to, to Abraham. In fact, P himself says by the name Jehovah, God was not known until the time of the Exodus, at least. So, so this is an anachronism, but Jay uses the term Jehovah everywhere for God. Okay, so let's talk about the creation of uh, Jay's creation, not of the world, but of man. You see, uh, P is interested in the creation of the sky and the heavens and the sun and the moon and the stars, and Jay could care less. It's all about mankind. So at the time, notice it, it begins with a, a subjunctive, just like uh, Genesis 1 did. When it happened, remember Jay, uh, P says, when God created the heavens and the earth, it was dark and there was evil. Jay says, when God created the earth and the heavens, notice the ordering. For P, it's the, the, the heavens and the earth. For J, it's the earth and the heavens. Now, uh, let me tell you where I'm at. This is uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, B. In other words, right in the middle of verse 4, at the beginning of verse 4, it's still P's account. In the, in the middle of verse 4, it jumps to J. And was, this is a place where the verses and the chapter breaks don't do us justice. We switch accounts right in the middle of a verse. But anyway, J, when J talks, he says, at the time when... Uh, when God Jehovah made the earth and the heavens, it's all the earth first, then the heavens, and then he never talks about the heavens again. He doesn't care. It's earth-centered. This is important for Jewish philosophy and, and theology because Judaism is all about merging a cosmic view of God, P, with a human view of God and scripture, and that's J, and you put the two accounts together and you, you get a, an overview of kind of Jewish thought. So when he began to make the earth, and, there was, and then he describes it. There was no grain on the field, etc. And, and there was no work you needed to do either. So you see from Jay's account, the, the initial creation is much more idyllic. P says evil was preexistent. And Jay says when the earth was created, it was good. And then things went wrong. See, that's a very different view of, of what's happening and why. 
Uh, Jehovah formed man, this is verse 7, from the clods of the soil. By the way, I'm reading from uh, Genesis uh, translation by E.A. Spicer. I, I um, gave that reference last class. Um, he made him from the clods of the soil. Now, man in Hebrew is Adam. So at first, it's a general term, mankind. And later, it becomes Adam, a, a proper name. Uh, but it, it, that tells us that Adam is intended to represent all of us. And the, the ground in Hebrew is Adama, which leads us to this idea of word plays. Uh, the term pun and word play, I don't like either one of them because they have this um, sense that it's a joke, right? that he's making jokes. And for, Hebrew, for the Hebrew authors, word plays were incredibly important. They were meaningful things. And so there is meaning in the words, and the words they choose are very carefully chosen to convey something. Adam was created from the Adama, the ground, and later in the curse, you'll notice that Adam is then cursed so that the key and the ground have an antagonistic relationship until he dies and returns to the ground from which he was formed. So th this, this word play is intentional and it, and it ha carries meaning to the author. So uh, this is the other thing I say. A good translation tells you when one Bible author is quoting another, and it also gives you footnotes to tell you when word plays are happening that don't translate because sometimes you just cannot translate a wordplay like the one we just saw, Adam and Ground. And I just lost my um, speaker. Let's see. Yeah, this is working. So can someone go uh, talk to uh, uh, our Rick? Rick, yeah. All right. So I'll keep going, and hopefully you can hear, hear me. So he, um, there it goes. He placed uh, the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, uh, God, Yahweh, caused to grow various trees that were a delight to the eye and good for eating, with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the tree of knowledge of good and evil it, it can be thought, uh, most people just think of it as the tree of knowledge of evil, but it's not. It's the knowledge of good and evil, which is going to raise a question. Why is that tree what's important, right? Why the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And, and by the knowledge of good and evil is kind of like if I were to tell you um, they came, young and old, it means everybody. By giving the two extremes, I mean them and everything in between. And, and I believe that's what's happening here. The tree of knowledge of good and evil means the tree of knowledge of everything. And one of the questions we have to ask is, why is knowledge of all things a bad thing? I want to come back to that one, though. Um, and a river rises in Eden and waters the garden. We'll skip this. Verse 16, and God, Yahweh, commanded the man, saying, You are free to eat of any tree of the garden, except only the tree of knowledge of good and bad, which you are not to eat. For behold, the moment you eat of it, you shall surely be doomed to death. Uh, so, uh, I guess I should have mentioned the, the terms Eden. Um, in, Ac in Akkadian, we have Edenu. Uh, in Sumerian, we have Eden. And in Hebrew, we have Eden. Uh, and it means in Sumerian something like a plain or a, or a, uh, a plateau, something like that, uh, possibly a reference to the delta of the Tigris-Euphrates rivers. Uh, and in Hebrew, it means the river, the, the, the place of delight. But you notice the connection here, that the, the story that the Jewish author is telling, the Hebrew author is telling, is tied to much older Akkadian and, and Sumerian traditions, just like the creation of Enuma Elish, et cetera. I should have mentioned that first. All right, forbidden knowledge, why? Why is it a tree of knowledge? Why not the tree of lust? Or why not the tree of envy or the tree of hate? You can eat of anything, just don't eat of hate. But, but instead, it's knowledge, and, and why is that? I don't have a terribly good answer, unfortunately. I, I, I wish I did, um, except that the author here is trying to convey the concept of innocence versus a lack of innocence that comes on the other side. You notice there is no reference to sex. It's not the tree of sex you can't eat about, although um, it's been interpreted that way. Uh, there could be a hint. Um, for example, uh, in, in Hebrew, a euphemism for sexual intercourse is to know. You know your spouse, and that has led people to see sexuality in this account, but it's not explicitly there. Um, that's a choice people are making, and that choice impacts how people view, for example, sexuality, etc. But there is clearly something going on about innocence. Now, I want to point out, the entire rest of the Hebrew Bible can be interpreted as God trying to teach the people knowledge and wisdom. 
The Bible commands us to seek knowledge and wisdom, the Old Testament especially. The Jewish tradition is knowledge-soaked. It's, it's all about knowing God. It's about, it's about knowing the law, studying the Torah. One of the prime methods of worship is to study so that you know. And so in a religious tradition where knowledge is key, the fall happens because someone eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And that's an enigma that is, I also believe is intentional. It forces us to struggle with the text, but I don't have a terribly good answer for it other than what the author is describing is the movement from innocence to wisdom. And it, it almost parallels our own growing up. We start out as a child and then we recognize that there really is something wrong with the world and, and people die. And things don't always go the way we want. And we grow up and we kind of lose our innocence as we gain knowledge of the consequences of good and of evil that are both here and present. It's a description of the human condition in that sense. So then God creates the animals. And he starts out by saying it's not good that man should be alone. We need to make a helper who is worthy of him. Again, this is a different order than what we saw in P. And then God brings all the animals to Adam to see what he will call them. Now, in P, God names everything. It's only when we get to J that Adam starts naming things. And in, again, in Hebrew, the one who names has power over the thing he names. He's controlled it, he's named it, he's organized it. And he's, it's almost like if you can label your pain, you can talk about it. And so labeling things and naming things is important. And Adam names things. This is, again, a hallmark of J. This is not something we would see uh, P do. P doesn't let Adam name things. In P, only God names things. So, um, so here we have uh, Adam naming stuff. And again, this is almost like trial and error. God, God's looking for a helper for Adam, but he doesn't know what helper he should give Adam. So he brings stuff to him. He's like, do you like the dog? No. Do you like the whale? No. Do you like the fit? No. This, none of this is really working. And God's trying stuff. And Adam's like rejecting everything. No, none of this is worthy of me. And then God makes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And from his side, he creates a rib. Or from his rib in his side, he creates a woman. And he brings the woman to Adam, and Adam says, yes, she's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken out of man. That word, that word play works in English, but it's the same in, he, in Hebrew. She'll be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. And, and then the two will leave their father. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they two shall be one flesh. Uh, so in this account, God is looking for a helper that is worthy, it says, of Adam. In, in the King James, it's help meet for, for God, for Adam, and that almost makes her sound like a help side of beef. That's not what the text is about. She's a helper that's worthy of man. So again, if you look at what the text says, in this instance, about the, the place of women, Women are corresponding to, equal to, worthy of man. I've heard the, the pun, he didn't make Eve out of Adam's head to rule over him or out of his feet so that he should rule over her, but out of his side, so she would stand at his side as equal partners. Now that, that's a nice sentiment. We'll see what the, te what the text does later on in a minute. But in this instance, she corresponds to him and she's his equal, which is an important point. Now... Uh, at this point, it says, uh, let me find the right place here. I can skip his commentary. Uh, and and um, I'm in the wrong place. Okay, and the two of them were naked, the man and his wife, yet they felt no shame. That is the last verse of chapter 2. And then the first verse of chapter 3 says, Now the serpent was the slyest of all the wild creatures that God, Jehovah, had made. Now it's tempting to break it there. You can see why Lanton broke it there. Because the first one is talking about the creation of man, and the next introduces the snake onto the scene, and we're starting to move towards the fall. It makes it a good place to break it. The problem is it breaks it right across an interesting wordplay that, again, we miss in the English. And that's between naked and this phrase used for the serpent that is sly, crafty and subtle. These two terms sound a lot alike in Hebrew. In fact, there's been some debate about whether they're from the same root. And yet they mean opposite things to some extent. And so here the Hebrew author is taking, J is taking a word that means either naked 
or subtle, and he's put them next to each other and said, what does this tell us about nakedness, subtlety, and the difference between innocence that Adam and Eve started with and the knowledge that they end up with? So notice something about snakes. They shed their skin. And in that sense, they, they make themselves naked all the time. And yet they are subtle creatures, crafty. They have word, street wisdom. On the left here, I have a picture of my son who's sitting in the back of the room and probably is, is embarrassed. And he's, he's naked. And he used to wander into the house, butt naked in front of all the neighbors, and he didn't care because he was Adam and Eve. He was innocent. And the two were naked, and they felt no shame. You see, shame for nudity isn't something we're born with. Uh, we're taught it because we adults are stupid about nudity and sexuality, and because we're ashamed, we, we teach it to children. But if you can imagine, if I could give my son a magic lollipop that would give him his, the wisdom he has today about nudity and the knowledge of the shamefulness of nudity, if I were to give it to him in the bath, he would stop smiling, and he'd probably run out screaming, trying to find a good place to hide. So this is what the, uh, one of the things the author is telling us about Adam and Eve and their movement from, from innocence to, to wisdom, which may or may not always be a good thing. And then the contrast with the serpent, who is the opposite thereof. Now notice something else interesting here. We usually interpret the fall as the origin of sin. That's how especially Christians interpret the fall. But notice something. The evil inclination is already there. The fall is an example, it's the archetypical example of this, but it is not the origin of this. Because if the fall is the origin of the evil inclination, where did Adam get his evil inclination? And if the fall is the origin of subtlety and wisdom and knowledge, why is the serpent already subtle and filled with knowledge? Uh, so the origin of the evil inclination is not the fall. However, for, for P it was preexistent. J doesn't tell us where it comes from. But Jay is quite clear that it is tied to our choice. You can choose, Jay says, good or bad. You can choose to obey or you can choose to disobey. And Adam chooses to disobey. And that is the origin of suffering, sin in the world. It's our choice. Because the serpent is subtle. He doesn't have to disobey. He chooses to. Adam is innocent. But he doesn't have to disobey, he chooses to. And so for J, it's choice. For P, it's preexistent. For J, the origin is choice. So uh, the serpent was more subtle of all the creatures. And uh, so, now let's see, um, I think we should probably read this. So said the serpent to the woman, even though God told you not to eat of any tree in the garden, and the woman interrupted the serpent, saying, but we may eat of all the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit of the tree of the middle of the garden that God said, do not eat of it, or as much as touches it, touch it, for you, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. No, 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 God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be the same as God in telling good from bad. This, of course begins the discussion of what is God's motivation. You see, the serpent is telling Eve that the reason she's not supposed to eat the tree is because God doesn't want you to be like him. The text never tells us for sure if the snake is lying. In fact, there's a later moment we'll see uh, when God says we don't want them to eat the fruit of the tree of life because then he'd be like us living forever. So there's this implication God doesn't want you to be like him. In the ancient Near Eastern text, that would make sense. You see, the gods uh, are properly in a place higher than us, and they don't want us to approach him. Um, but the Jewish texts, again, seem to say, God wants you to be holy because God is holy. That's the definition of holiness in, in Leviticus. And, and there's a lot of Jewish uh, theology that says God wants us to imitate him. And so again, this is, a, this is a, in contrast, and the author doesn't tell us exactly his position. But it, at least we know the serpent is lying about death, sort of, Right, Because God says, in the day you eat, you will be doomed to death. They eat and they don't immediately die, but they do die. And so there's a half-truth buried in here. Um, and then there's this implication that God just doesn't want you to be like him. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for eating and delight to the eye, and that there was attractive as a means to wisdom, she took the fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband, and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they discovered that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, or loincloths. 
We will come back to this when we talk about ritual implications. We're not going to do it now. And then they heard of sound, the sound of God, Yahweh, as he was walking in the garden in the breezy time of day. You notice that, again, I told you about the anthropomorphic. Here's God strolling down the garden, enjoying the breeze. And I told you, these things are just vivid. You can just see God kind of wandering through the garden, enjoying the breeze, not aware of what's happened. It's a very anthropomorphic view of God. And the man and his wife uh, hid from God, Yahweh, among the trees of the garden. And God, Yahweh, called, now, now why? Because they're still ashamed of their nakedness, but they made for themselves an apron of fig leaves. There's an implication here, and that's that their first attempt to cover their nakedness failed because they're still ashamed. That's going to be important in a minute. And God, God Yahweh, called to the man and said, where are you? I can just imagine God losing track of Adam. Now, of course, you can see that as a, as a rhetorical question. Maybe God is all-knowing and he knows where Adam is. But Jay still portrays God this way. It's just fascinating. Where are you? And, and, and Adam answered, I heard the sound of you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he asked, who told you you were naked? Did you then taste of the tree from which I've forbidden you to eat? And the man, as if, again, as if God doesn't know what's happened. And the man replied, the woman who you put at my side, notice the reference to side, she's my equal. The woman who you put at my side, I, I love this, it's not my fault. The woman who you put at my side, now that's, that's again very important. Where the woman belongs in the beginning is at the side of man. Where she will be put at a later point in the text is different. And we have at least now two references, not just one to where she was created from the rib, but another where Adam interprets it as, she's supposed to be my equal. And you did this to me. You put her there. <laughs> and you put this equal beside my side. And she gave me the fruit, and I did eat. So it's her fault. And then uh, God said uh, to the woman, how could you do such a thing? And the woman said, the serpent tricked me, and I did eat. It's his fault. But they're passing the buck. I love this. Uh, and so God said to the serpent, now we get what's called the judgments. So let's start with the judgments. Because you did this, banned you shall be from all cattle. You'll notice the cattle and the, and the serpents don't get along. You're not going to be like the cattle. And all the other wild creatures, snakes don't get along with other creatures. And on your belly you shall crawl and the dirt you shall feed all the days of your life. You see, he gave Eve something to eat and so God condemns him to eat dust. This is a story that we call kind of a mythical interpretation. Uh, the purpose of a story like this is to take something weird in the world and give an explanation for why it is the way it is. Why do snakes crawl on the ground? Why do they eat dust? Why do all the other animals not get along with snakes? Well, this is the reason. Um, and, and notice that I think what's important about this is it's not to say this is the way things are supposed to be. It's an explanation of why things are the way they are already, which is going to be important when we get to the woman. And I will pl plant enmity between you and the woman. Notice the word plant. I love that. It's, it's again a pun back to the planting of the garden and the, the fruit and all that. I will plant enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and their offspring, and they shall strike at your head and you shall strike at their heel. This is a reference to people. When you see snakes, you step on their heads. And when snakes see people, they bite us on the heel. And if they're poisonous, we die. There's enmity between us and snakes. It's why they're living on the ground. It's why they're crawling on their belly. It's why they bite us all the time. And it's why we constantly try to crush them whenever we see them. It's why when a, when a, when a person picks up a snake, they go, ooh, and they freak out. You all can feel it, by the way, can't you? When I show you pictures of the snake, it's that, ooh, that's the enmity. So why do we have this enmity? Well, this is the reason. It's, it's, an ex, it's a mythical explanation for a pre-existing condition. Um, and uh, there has been uh, attempts by Christian authors to turn that into a symbol of Christ, that, that Christ will, is the offspring of the woman and he will crush the serpent's head and that means Christ will overcome Satan. I want you to notice two things. First of all, this is a talking snake. There is no reference to Satan anywhere. And in fact, the interpretation of Satan as a tempter is very late in, in, in the Hebrew, in the evolution of the Hebrew tradition. This is not a reference to Satan. This is a, a reference to serpents and a talking snake. And that other interpretation is layered on top of it later. I'm not saying that's not a useful symbolic interpretation if you want, but it's late. It's a later idea. It's not in the original text. Uh, so let's see. Uh, then to the woman, he says, uh, I will 
make intense your pains in childbearing, and pain you shall bear children, and your urge shall be to your husband, and he shall be your master. So this is, this, this is the um, curse given to women, although I guess curse is the wrong word. This is the judgment given to women. Uh, first of all, it's another one of those explanations for why things are the way they are. Why does it hurt to give birth? Well, this is why. Why do men rule over women? Well, this is why. Now, you can maybe start to see why I made such a big deal about that. This text has been used throughout time to put women in their place, to make sure that men rule over women, because that's how God intended. But you'll notice, in this text, there is no sense that God requires these things or that that's how he originally created things. I mean, the, the implication is the serpent had legs before and he, gets, he starts crawling on his belly because of the fall. There's no indication that God wanted that. That's a result of the fall. When God created the woman, he creates her at Adam's side. And because of the fall, mankind rule over Adam. This is very important, I think, when you talk to your evangelical friends who want to use this as a justification for putting women in their place. It's very easy to respond by saying, the text says when God originally created women, they were our equal, mankind, man's equal. And it was the fall that caused man to rule over women. There is no indication in the text that God wouldn't be pleased if we could work to go back to the way things were before. That is not said anywhere. Uh, Again, if we think of this as, as a mythic story, it's a story that explains why things are the way they are when the author wrote the tale. In other words, the author wrote this tale at a time when men ruled over women, and he needed a story to explain why things were that way. Not because he thought that's the way things have to be, or because we have to think that's the way things have to be, but because he's making a mythical story to explain why things are the way they are. Now, uh, again, I, I, I mention this because I think I want to make sure we understand how easy it is to take a text and interpret it in 180 different degrees different ways. There are fundamentalists who read this text and say, this proves that women are supposed to be subordinate. And there are liberals who read this text and say, this proves that God wanted women to be equal, but we screwed it up. We should try to make them equal again. That's 180 degree different interpretation, all from the same text. So when we try to justify our morality out of the Bible, you can do almost whatever you want. And, and I think that's a, a really important point. We, we tend to ascribe to God as a mirror of our own beliefs. We build God in our own image, and if we believe women should be equal, we make God that way, and we read the text that way. If we think women should be subordinate, we make God that way, and then we read the text that way. And so... This is one of the problems with fundamentalism. You can always tell when someone walks up to you and says, I don't interpret the Bible, I just read it. And that's what it says. It just, why are you arguing with God? Well, anyone who does that is not self-aware of what they are doing. It's impossible to read the Bible without interpreting it and without imposing your own worldview onto it. Okay, so that's the women. To the man, he says, there will be thorns and thistles, and you will be at enmity with the ground. We already talked about that. You'll be, you'll be enmity between you and the ground. You were taken from the ground. You will have to work hard by the sweat of your brow to make food grow from the ground, and eventually you will die and return to the ground you came from. Those are the judgments. And then the man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Eve's name means life, and so she is the mother and the source of all life and living. And God Yahweh made shirts and coats of skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. So, remember I said Adam's first attempt to clothe himself and cover his nakedness is unsuccessful, so God comes along and does it for him. God makes the first coats of skins. Now, what does this mean? To make a coat of skin, what do you have to do? You have to kill something. You see, this is the very first reference anywhere in the biblical text of death. And God said, when you eat the fruit, you will die. And this is a reference to the death of an animal. But the implication is death spreads from Adam's actions to all of creation and the animals die and death comes because of what Adam has done. And now the first thing has died. And you can almost see this and most of the apocryphal stories do as the first sacrifice. God teaches them how to offer sacrifice, takes the skin from the first sacrifice, and makes from it a coat of skins to clothe them. 
And you can see how sacrifice then gets woven into this story of the fall and an attempt at repentance. But it's also a source of death. And this will have ritual implications in a minute, which we will talk about. And then we get the expulsion. Um, <clears throat> now, Jehovah says, Now the man has become like one of us in distinguishing good from bad. What if he should put out his hand and taste also of the tree of life and eat and live forever? So, to prevent this, God banished them from the Garden of Eden to till the soil from which he was taken. Because you already know good from evil, we can't let you live forever because then you would be like us. Like God, like, like the angels, the heavenly host, etc. This is again where we get that idea God doesn't really want us to be like him. Um, I believe this also parallels very well what we have in the Epic of Gilgamesh. You remember Gilgamesh tries to find the, the plant of life and live forever, and, and he has to be told by Utnapishtim, this is not your place. You're supposed to die, you're not supposed to live forever. So to keep that from having happening, he having expelled the man, he stationed east of the Garden of Eden, the cherubim and the fiery revolving sword to guard the way of the Tree of Life, to make sure he doesn't live forever, so he puts an angel there with, with a flaming sword to keep the the way of the tree of life uh, protected from Adam so that he does not live forever. All right, interpretations of this story. And throughout time, we'll kind of talk about all the different ones we've seen. The, not all, some of, the, some of the more important ones. Um, the first is a Jewish interpretation that sees Adam as, as, as a, a metaphor for all of Israel, for the history of the children of Israel. You'll notice they're created from the dust of Egypt, taken to a promised land flowing with milk and honey, there they're given commandments, but because they break the commandments, they are expelled, and expulsion is the place of all mankind. You see, they're seeing, they see expulsion as the lot of mankind, and the example of Adam and Eve's expulsion is, is the archetype of the very um, process of Israel as a nation. Again, that's metaphorical, which, which should help if we start talking about whether this Adam is a real person or not. But I think one of the most striking uh, examples has to do with Israelite ritual. You see, God existed up on his throne. He created the world in the garden. He put man in the garden. They fell, so we got a cherubim and a flaming sword. And then they wander to a land where they make an altar. And there Cain and Abel offer sacrifices to God in an attempt to return. If we lay that against the temple, you have the ark. That's God upon his throne. You have the holy place. That's the garden uh, where... Uh, people eat. There's a showbread there that represents the fruit of the tree of, of life as opposed to the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And outside you have ritual washing and places of sacrifice where you repent and turn around. In fact, in Hebrew, to repent means to turn around. So you can imagine Adam starting in the Holy of Holies and walking out as you go through Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, and he finds himself in the courtyard. There Cain and Abel have their fight, and Cain is expelled clear out of the temple. But Adam turns around and walks back the other direction. You see, this is the other interesting thing. Christians today often will see Adam as the source of all evil and, and suffering and sin. Uh, but in early Christian tradition, Adam was the example of the first sinner, but we are all sinners. He's also the example of the first repenter, and they have all sorts of early Christian stories of Adam's repentance and his acceptance of, by God as a repented person. So Adam is the source of, or the first sinner, but he's also the first repenter in these early Christian stories. And the temple itself has the garden story built into it as a mechanism of showing the reversal of that, bringing you back into the presence of God, exile. Now remember, there were two main penalties, death and exile. And so the redemption from exile and the redemption from death is the point of the Israelite temple. We also have this reference to the, fig, the apron of fig leaves. I said we'd go back to that. In the Jewish temple, well, before that, in temples all around the world, including Egypt, the apron was a symbol of the priesthood. That's because priests would kill things, and so they would wear aprons like the butcher, the butcher apron and the, and the, and the stonemason's apron. Those are the worker's aprons, and the priesthood was its own job, and you wore an apron because it represented... I have all these sorts of pictures from Egypt of the priests wearing aprons. Aprons are the symbol of priesthood. Adam tried to do it himself and failed. So in the temple, the priest wears a different apron. This is the ephod. So you notice the priest's clothing in the Israelite temple contains this apron. This apron is in opposition, justification. And, and, and what, like I said, in the fall, you go out of the temple. In the atonement, you return through the temple, and the priest wears an apron, uh, which is the opposite of the apron Adam and Eve wear. 
God also makes the coat of skins, like I talked about the first sacrifice. And so we have this coat, same Hebrew word, that the priests, uh, that the, the priests wear, except it's a coat of linen. The opposition is to make a coat of skins, things have to die. That's the fall. To make a coat of linen, it's clean from death because it's made out of plant material. And so you have the coat of linen and the coat of skins placed in opposition to each other. And on the Day of Atonement, you have two goats. One is expelled and takes the sins of Israel with it, called the scapegoat. And the other is the goat for Jehovah. And that's actually where the term scapegoat comes from. And the other is goat is dedicated to Jehovah and it's sacrificed <laughs> as food to Jehovah. So and so... Probably. Uh, and so uh, this is the two penalties for sin. So what we have here is, is a, a substitute taking upon itself the penalties. The fall created two penalties, expulsion and death. So we have two goats. One is expelled and one dies. These are the penalties Adam and Eve suffered. And the goats take those penalties on for us to enable us to be atoned and reconciled with God, to undo the fall, if you will. So the, the story has ritual implications for Israel. There are two papers, uh, Sanctuary Symbolism in the Garden of Eden story. I have a link to that in Garden of Eden Prototype Sanctuary by my Hebrew teacher. He's a Mormon, Donald Perry. The first is not a Mormon, the second, second is. But I have links to both of their articles. And I've left out all sorts of things. Word plays, uh, the temple work is connected to the dress it and keep it command given to Adam and Eve. There are, there are tons of connections here, and I've breezed over them. If you want to learn more about the connections between the Adam and Eve story and the Israelite temple, these are two great articles I recommend you read. Finally, uh, Christ and Adam. The reason Christians especially are so obsessed with the Garden of Eden story is because of Romans 5. If it wasn't for Paul, we wouldn't be having this class, we wouldn't care. But Paul makes a big deal of this story. In Romans 5 he says, he calls Jesus Christ the second Adam. The first Adam is the man God tried to create who failed. Christ is the man God wants us to be. He's God himself made man, and he succeeds where Adam failed. He kept the commandments where Adam didn't. He died on a tree. Now, this is a beautiful allegory, by the way. He dies on a tree, hanging his flesh on that tree as if his flesh were the fruit of the tree of life. In opposition to Adam who ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge and fell. So Christ used and, and created death by doing so. Therefore, Christ used the fall that allowed death and died through the fall to bring life through the atonement being hung upon a tree. The two are opposites. And Paul makes this beautiful allegory between the fall and the atonement. That's why this story is so important to Christians. You'll notice they will draw the cross as a tree they will often place Adam's skull at the bottom of the tree, so Christ anoints that skull with his blood as he dies to atone for Adam's death. You see, death entered because of Adam, so there's the skull. I love this picture. It's my favorite uh, depiction of this idea. On one side, you see Mary, the, father, the mother of Christ, picking from a tree the Eucharist, the, the, the wafer of bread that people eat in Christian uh, Eucharist ritual. On the other side, we have Eve taking from the serpent the tree of death and passing it out to those who will, as if it were the Eucharist, to those who will suffer and die. And the two are placed in opposition. And this is Paul's doctrine. The first Adam, the second Adam. We even have Mary and Eve placed as, as parallels. We have Adam and Christ placed as parallels. We have Christ's flesh, in fact, hung upon this tree. And so the tree is both the tree of life and death. One is the tree of knowledge, one is the tree of life. And they're the same, or they are opposites, and one undoes the other. This is why so many people in the United States do not believe in evolution. In fact, it's, it's the majority of people, if you have kind of a survey. And the reason for that is because of this theology. So I want you to understand what's happened here. They come along and they say, if Adam did not fall and create something with his fall, then we don't need Christ. And so if you tell me Adam is just a myth, then you're telling me that the entire atonement of Christ, the entire purpose of Christianity is, is unnecessary and nonsense. And so they've tied, in a fundamentalist sort of way, the need for Adam to be a real person to the idea that if he's not, the entire point of Christianity is moot. Now, 
no, I don't believe that. Uh, and and I, it doesn't, you know, I know, I know a lot of you aren't Christians, and, it, and that's fine too. But when we talk to people, again, if, I believe if we make this dichotomy or support this dichotomy, we make things worse. The truth is, if the story is an allegory that tells us about the human condition, which I believe it is, then it's entirely possible for Christ to come and use symbolic elements of that story to teach us about he, how he overcomes the human conditions. He's saying that Adam is a myth or, or is a mythical figure does not mean that the human condition that is described in that story isn't real. It doesn't mean there's nothing for Christ to do. It doesn't mean there's no atonement that's needed. It just means that the story is a myth designed to tell us about the human condition and Christ's atonement has elements that mirror that myth in order to show how he overcomes the human condition. There is, this is not a necessary either or. It's possible to believe in evolution if you want and to believe in Jesus Christ and the need for an atonement and all the rest that goes with it and to see the parallels and the symbols between the atonement in Jewish temple ritual and the atonement of Jesus Christ that, that, that dovetail upon this story of the fall because it is a very important story for Christian theology. Now, I have this list of things. I didn't even talk about original sin, but you'll notice that original sin is nowhere in the text. Uh, there's no reference to this idea that we're born, fallen, and depraved. There's no reference to this idea that, that sexuality causes us to be born with original sin. It's not there. Adam already has the evil inclination. He chooses. We already have it. We choose. It's, it's already there. Now, I'm out of time, but I hope that what we've done has given you some idea of why this text is so important, why it influences things like the role of women in, in, in our society today, why so many people are unable to reconcile this story with evolution and, and how its symbolism ties into everything from the Eucharist to the Jewish temple tradition, etc. So that was my goal. I hope that I've succeeded. Next time, we're gonna t I'm going to actually finally tell you about the documentary hypothesis. I'll actually go through, I've showed you some J stuff. I showed some people. We're going to go through all of their, all that, when the dating is, why people decided that there are authors, how they divide up the authors, how they figure out who wrote what. And then we'll tell the Cain and Abel story, the flood story, and the Tower of Babel. And that'll be our next class. And I hope to see you all there. I think it Thanks. Stands.